Chapter Forty Three A Friend in Need. The election day came at last. There was no lack of work for Jerry and me. First came a stout, puffy gentleman with a carpet bag. He wanted to go to the Bishopsgate station. Then we were called by a party who wished to be taken to the Regent's Park. And next we were wanted in the side street, where a timid, anxious old lady was waiting to be taken to the bank. There we had to stop to take her back again. And just as we had set her down, a red-faced gentleman with a handful of papers came running up out of breath. And before Jerry could get down, he had opened the door, popped himself in, and called out, "Bow Street Police Station, quick!" So off we went with him. And when, after another turn or two, we came back, there was no other cab on the stand. Jerry put on my nose bag, for as he said, "We must eat when we can on such days as these. So munch away, Jack, and make the best of your time, old boy." I found I had a good feed of crushed oats, wetted up with a little bran. This would be a treat any day, but very refreshing then. Jerry was so thoughtful and kind. What horse would not do his best for such a master? Then he took out one of Polly's meat pies, and standing near me, he began to eat it. The streets were very full, and the cabs, with the candidates' colours on them, were dashing about through the crowd as if life and limb were of no consequence. We saw two people knocked down that day, and one was a woman. The horses were having a bad time of it, poor things, but the voters inside thought nothing of that. Many of them were half drunk, hurrahing out of the cab windows if their own party came by. It was the first election I had seen, and I don't want to be in another, though I have heard things are better now. Jerry and I had not eaten many mouthfuls before a poor young woman carrying a heavy child came along the street. She was looking this way and that way, and seemed quite bewildered. Presently, she made her way up to Jerry and asked if he could tell her the way to St. Thomas's Hospital and how far it was to get there. She had come from the country that morning, she said, in a market cart. She did not know about the election and was quite a stranger in London. She had got an order for the hospital for her little boy. The child was crying with a feeble, pining cry. "Poor little fellow," she said. "He suffers a great deal of pain." He is four years old and can't walk any more than a baby, but the doctor said if I could get him into the hospital, he might get well. Pray, sir, how far is it, and which way is it? Why, missus," said Jerry, "you can't get there walking through crowds like this. Why, it is three miles away, and that child is heavy. Yes, bless him, he is, but I am strong, thank God. And if I knew the way, I think I should get on somehow. Please tell me the way. You can't do it," said Jerry. "You might be knocked down, and the child be run over. Now look here. Just get into this cab, and I'll drive you safe to the hospital. Don't you see the rain is coming on? No, sir, no. I can't do that. Thank you. I have only just enough money to get back with. Please tell me the way. Look you here, missus," said Jerry. "I've got a wife and dear children at home, and I know a father's feelings." Now get you into that cab, and I'll take you there for nothing. I'd be ashamed of myself to let a woman and a sick child run a risk like that. Heaven bless you," said the woman, and burst into tears. There, there, cheer up, my dear. I'll soon take you there. Come, let me put you inside. As Jerry went to open the door, two men with colours in their hats and buttonholes ran up, calling out, "Cab!" Engaged," cried Jerry. But one of the men, pushing past the woman, sprang into the cab, followed by the other. Jerry looked as stern as a policeman. This cab is already engaged, gentlemen, by that lady. Lady said one of them. Oh, she can wait. Our business is very important. Besides, we were in first. It is our right, and we shall stay in. A droll smile came over Jerry's face as he shut the door upon them. All right, gentlemen. Pray stay in as long as it suits you. I can wait while you rest yourselves. And turning his back upon them, he walked up to the young woman who was standing near me. They'll soon be gone," he said, laughing. "Don't trouble yourself, my dear." And they soon were gone, for when they understood Jerry's dodge, they got out, calling him all sorts of bad names and blustering about his number and getting a summons. After this little stoppage, we were soon on our way to the hospital. Going as much as possible through by streets, Jerry rung the great bell 
and helped the young woman out. "'Thank you a thousand times,' she said. "'I could never have got here alone.' "'You're kindly welcome, and I hope the dear child will soon be better.' He watched her go in at the door, and gently he said to himself, "'Inasmuch as ye have done it to one of the least of these.' Then he patted my neck, which was always his way when anything pleased him. The rain was now coming down fast, and just as we were leaving the hospital the door opened again, and the porter called out, Cab! We stopped, and a lady came down the steps. Jerry seemed to know her at once. She put back her veil and said, Barker? Jeremiah Barker? Is it you? I am very glad to find you here. You are just the friend I want, for it is very difficult to get a cab in this part of London to-day. I shall be proud to serve you, ma'am. I am right glad I happen to be here. Where may I take you to, ma'am? To the Paddington station, and then, if we are in good time, as I think we shall be, you shall tell me all about Mary and the children. We got to the station in good time, and being under shelter the lady stood a good while talking to Jerry. I found she had been Polly's mistress, and after many inquiries about her she said, How do you find the cab work suit you in winter? I know Mary was rather anxious about you last year. Yes, ma'am, she was. I had a bad cough that followed me quite up into the warm weather, and when I am kept out late she does worry herself a good deal. You see, ma'am, it is all hours and all weathers, and that does try a man's constitution, but I am getting on pretty well, and I should feel quite lost if I had not horses to look after. I was brought up to it, and I am afraid I should not do so well at anything else. Well, Barker, she said, it would be a great pity that you should seriously risk your health in this work, not only for your own, but for Mary's and the children's sake. There are many places where good drivers or good grooms are wanted, and if ever you think you ought to give up this cab work, let me know. Then, sending some kind messages to Mary, she put something into his hand, saying, There is five shillings each for the two children. Mary will know how to spend it. Jerry thanked her, and seemed much pleased, and turning out of the station we at last reached home, and I, at least, was tired. End of chapter 43 Chapter 44 Old Captain and His Successor Captain and I were great friends. He was a noble old fellow, and he was very good company. I never thought that he would have to leave his home and go down the hill, but his turn came, and this was how it happened. I was not there, but I heard all about it. He and Jerry had taken a party to the great railway station over London Bridge, and were coming back, somewhere between the bridge and the monument, when Jerry saw a brewer's empty dray coming along drawn by two powerful horses. The drayman was lashing his horses with his heavy whip, the dray was light, and they started off at a furious rate. The man had no control over them, and the street was full of traffic. One young girl was knocked down and run over, and the next moment they dashed up against our cab. Both the wheels were torn off, and the cab was thrown over. Captain was dragged down, the shafts splintered, and one of them ran into his side. Jerry, too, was thrown, but was only bruised. Nobody could tell how he escaped. He always said twas a miracle. When poor Captain was got up, he was found to be very much cut and knocked about. Jerry led him home gently, and a sad sight it was to see the blood soaking into his white coat and dropping from his side and shoulder. The drayman was proved to be very drunk and was fined, and the brewer had to pay damages to our master, but there was no one to pay damages to poor Captain. The farrier and Jerry did the best they could to ease his pain and make him comfortable. The fly had to be mended, and for several days I did not go out, and Jerry earned nothing. The first time we went to the stand after the accident, the governor came up to hear how Captain was. "'He'll never get over it,' said Jerry, "'at least not for my work,' so the farrier said this morning. "'He says he may do for carting and that sort of work. It has put me out very much. Carting, indeed! I've seen what horses come to at that work around London. I only wish all the drunkards could be put in a lunatic asylum instead of being allowed to run foul of sober people. If they would break their own bones, and smash their own carts, and lame their own horses, that would be their own affair, and we might let them alone. 
but it seems to me that the innocent always suffer, and then they talk about compensation. You can't make compensation. There's all the trouble and vexation and loss of time, besides losing a good horse that's like an old friend. It's nonsense talking of compensation. If there's one devil that I should like to see in the bottomless pit more than another, it's the drink devil. I say, Jerry, said the governor, you are treading pretty hard on my toes, you know. I'm not so good as you are, more shame to me. I wish I was. Well, said Jerry, why don't you cut with it, governor? You are too good a man to be the slave of such a thing. I'm a great fool, Jerry, but I tried once for two days, and I thought I should have died. How did you do? I had hard work at it for several weeks. You see, I never did get drunk, but I found that I was not my own master, and that when the craving came on it was hard work to say no. I saw that one of us must knock under, the drink devil or Jerry Barker, and I said that it should not be Jerry Barker, God helping me. But it was a struggle, and I wanted all the help I could get, for till I tried to break the habit I did not know how strong it was. But then Polly took such pains that I should have good food, and when the craving came on I used to get a cup of coffee, or some peppermint, or read a bit in my book, and that was a help to me. Sometimes I had to say over and over to myself, Give up the drink or lose your soul, give up the drink or break Polly's heart. But thanks be to God, and my dear wife, my chains were broken, and now for ten years I have not tasted a drop, and never wish for it. I've a great mind to try at it, said Grant, for tis a poor thing not to be one's own master. Do, Governor, do, you'll never repent it, and what a help it would be to some of the poor fellows in our rank if they saw you do without it. I know there's two or three would like to keep out of that tavern if they could. At first Captain seemed to do well, but he was a very old horse, and it was only his wonderful constitution, and Jerry's care, that had kept him up at the cab work so long. Now he broke down very much. The farrier said he might mend up enough to sell for a few pounds, but Jerry said no, a few pounds got by selling a good old servant into hard work and misery would canker all the rest of his money, and he thought the kindest thing he could do for the fine old fellow would be to put a sure bullet through his head, and then he would never suffer more, for he did not know where to find a kind master for the rest of his days. The day after this was decided, Harry took me to the forge for some new shoes. When I returned, Captain was gone. I and the family all felt it very much. Jerry had now to look out for another horse, and he soon heard of one through an acquaintance who was undergroom in a nobleman's stables. He was a valuable young horse, but he had run away, smashed into another carriage, flung his lordship out, and so cut and blemished himself that he was no longer fit for a gentleman's stables, and the coachman had orders to look round and sell him as well as he could. "'I can do with high spirits,' said Jerry, "'if a horse is not vicious or hard-mouthed.' "'There is not a bit of vice in him,' said the man. "'His mouth is very tender, and I think myself that was the cause of the accident. "'You see, he had just been clipped, and the weather was bad, "'and he had not had exercise enough, "'and when he did go out he was as full of spring as a balloon. "'Our governor, the coachman, I mean, "'had him harnessed in as tight and strong as he could, "'with the martingale and the check-rein, "'a very sharp curb, and the reins put in at the bottom bar. "'It is my belief that it made the horse mad,' being tender in the mouth and so full of spirit. "'Likely enough. I'll come and see him,' said Jerry. The next day Hotspur, that was his name, came home. He was a fine brown horse, without a white hair in him, as tall as Captain, with a very handsome head, and only five years old. I gave him a friendly greeting by way of good fellowship, but did not ask him any questions. The first night he was very restless. Instead of lying down, he kept jerking his halter rope up and down through the ring, and knocking the block about against the manger, till I could not sleep. However, the next day, after five or six hours in the cab, he came in quiet and sensible. Jerry patted and talked to him a good deal, and very soon they understood each other, and Jerry said that with an easy bit and plenty of work he would be as gentle as a lamb and that it was an ill wind that blew nobody good, for if his lordship had lost a hundred-guinea favourite, the cabman had gained a good horse with all his strength in him. 
Hotspur thought it a great come down to be a cab horse, and was disgusted at standing in the rank. But he confessed to me at the end of the week that an easy mouth and a free head made up for a great deal. And, after all, the work was not so degrading as having one's head and tail fastened to each other at the saddle. In fact, he settled in well, and Jerry liked him very much. End of chapter 44 Chapter 45 Jerry's New Year For some people, Christmas and the New Year are very merry times, but for cabmen and cabmen's horses it is no holiday, though it may be a harvest. There are so many parties, balls, and places of amusement open that the work is hard and often late. Sometimes driver and horse have to wait for hours in the rain or frost, shivering with the cold, while the merry people within are dancing away to the music. I wonder if the beautiful ladies ever think of the weary cabman waiting on his box, and his patient beast standing till his legs get stiff with cold. I had now most of the evening work, as I was well accustomed to standing, and Jerry was also more afraid of Hotspur taking cold. We had a great deal of late work in the Christmas week, and Jerry's cough was bad, but however late we were, Polly sat up for him, and came out with a lantern to meet him, looking anxious and troubled. On the evening of the new year we had to take two gentlemen to a house in one of the West End squares. We set them down at nine o'clock, and were told to come again at eleven. But, said one, as it is a card party, you may have to wait a few minutes, but don't be late. As the clock struck eleven we were at the door, for Jerry was always punctual. The clock chimed the quarters, one, two, three, and then struck twelve, but the door did not open. The wind had been very changeable, with squalls of wind during the day, but now it came on sharp, driving sleet, which seemed to come all the way round. It was very cold, and there was no shelter. Jerry got off his box and came and pulled one of my cloths a little more over my neck. Then he took a turn or two up and down, stamping his feet. Then he began to beat his arms, but that set him off coughing, so he opened the cab door and sat at the bottom with his feet on the pavement, and was a little sheltered. Still the clock chimed the quarters, and no one came. At half-past twelve he rang the bell, and asked the servant if he would be wanted that night. "'Oh, yes, you'll be wanted safe enough,' said the man. "'You must not go. It will soon be over.' And again Jerry sat down, but his voice was so hoarse I could hardly hear him. At a quarter-past one the door opened, and the two gentlemen came out. They got into the cab without a word, and told Jerry where to drive, that was nearly two miles. My legs were numb with cold, and I thought I should have stumbled. When the men got out, they never said they were sorry to have kept us waiting so long, but were angry at the charge. However, as Jerry never charged more than was his due, so he never took less, and they had to pay for the two hours and a quarter waiting, but it was hard-earned money to Jerry. At last we got home. He could hardly speak, and his cough was dreadful. Polly asked no questions, but opened the door and held the lantern for him. "'Can't I do something?' she said. "'Yes, get Jack something warm, and then boil me some gruel.' This was said in a hoarse whisper. He could hardly get his breath, but he gave me a rub-down as usual, and even went up into the hayloft for an extra bundle of straw for my bed. Polly brought me a warm mash that made me comfortable, and then they locked the door. It was late the next morning before any one came, and then it was only Harry. He cleaned us and fed us and swept out the stalls, then he put the straw back again as if it was Sunday. He was very still, and neither whistled nor sang. At noon he came again and gave us our food and water. This time Dolly came with him. She was crying, and I could gather from what they said that Jerry was dangerously ill, and the doctor said it was a bad case. So two days passed, and there was great trouble indoors. We only saw Harry, and sometimes Dolly. I think she came for company, for Polly was always with Jerry, and he had to be kept very quiet. On the third day, while Harry was in the stable, a tap came at the door, and Governor Grant came in. "'I wouldn't go to the house, my boy,' he said, "'but I want to know how your father is.' 
"'He is very bad,' said Harry. "'He can't be much worse. They call it bronchitis. The doctor thinks it will turn one way or another to-night.' "'That's bad, very bad,' said Grant, shaking his head. "'I know two men have died of that last week. It takes them off in no time. But while there's life there's hope, so you must keep up your spirits.' "'Yes,' said Harry quickly, "'and the doctor said that father had a better chance than most men, because he didn't drink. He said yesterday the fever was so high that if father had been a drinking man it would have burned him up like a piece of paper. But I believe he thinks he will get over it. Don't you think he will, Mr. Grant?' The governor looked puzzled. "'If there's any rule that good men should get over these things, I'm sure he will, my boy. He's the best man I know. I'll look in early to-morrow.' Early next morning he was there. "'Well,' said he. "'Father is better,' said Harry. "'Mother hopes he will get over it.' "'Thank God,' said the governor. "'And now you must keep him warm and keep his mind easy. And that brings me to the horses. You see Jack will be all the better for the rest of a week or two in a warm stable, and you can easily take him a turn up and down the street to stretch his legs. But this young one, if he does not get work, he will soon be all up on end, as you may say, and will be rather too much for you, and when he does go out there'll be an accident. "'It is like that now,' said Harry. "'I have kept him short of corn, but he's so full of spirit I don't know what to do with him.' "'Just so,' said Grant. "'Now look here. Will you tell your mother that if she is agreeable I will come for him every day till something is arranged, and take him for a good spell of work, and whatever he earns I'll bring your mother half of it, and that will help with the horse's feed.' Your father is in a good club, I know, but that won't keep the horses, and they'll be eating their heads off all this time. I'll come at noon and hear what she says. And without waiting for Harry's thanks, he was gone. At noon I think he went and saw Polly, for he and Harry came to the stable together, harnessed Hotspur, and took him out. For a week or more he came for Hotspur, and when Harry thanked him or said anything about his kindness, he laughed it off saying it was all good luck for him, for his horses were wanting a little rest which they would not have otherwise had. Jerry grew better steadily, but the doctor said he must never go back to the cab work again if he wished to be an old man. The children had many consultations together about what father and mother would do, and how they could help to earn money. One afternoon Hotspur was brought in very wet and dirty. "'The streets are nothing but slush,' said the governor. It will give you a good warming, my boy, to get him clean and dry. All right, governor, said Harry. I shall not leave him till he is. You know I have been trained by my father. I wish all the boys had been trained like you, said the governor. While Harry was sponging off the mud from Hotspur's body and legs, Dolly came in, looking very full of something. Who lives at Fairstow, Harry? Mother has a letter from Fairstow. She seemed so glad, and ran upstairs to father with it. "'Don't you know? Why, it is the name of Mrs. Fowler's place. Mother's old mistress, you know, the lady that father met last summer, who sent you and me five shillings each.' "'Oh, Mrs. Fowler! Of course I know all about her. I wonder what she is writing to mother about.' "'Mother wrote to her last week,' said Harry. "'You know she told father if ever he gave up the cab work she would like to know. I wonder what she says. Run in and see, Dolly.' Harry scrubbed away at Hotspur with a whoosh, whoosh, like any old hostler. In a few minutes Dolly came dancing into the stable. "'Oh, Harry, there was never anything so beautiful. Mrs. Fowler says we are all to go and live near her. There is a cottage now empty that will just suit us, with a garden and a hen-house and apple-trees and everything, and her coachman is going away in the spring, and then she will want father in his place.' and there are good families round, where you can get a place in the garden, or the stable, or as a page-boy, and there's a good school for me, and mother is laughing and crying by turns, and father does look so happy. That's uncommon jolly, said Harry, and just the right thing, I should say. It will suit father and mother both, but I don't intend to be a page-boy with tight clothes and rows of buttons. I'll be a groom, or a gardener. It was quickly settled that as soon as Cherry was well enough, they should remove to the country, and that the cab and horses should be sold as soon as possible. This was heavy news for me, for I was not young now, and could not look for any improvement in my condition. 
Since I left Birtwick, I had never been so happy as with my dear master Jerry, but three years of cab work, even under the best conditions, will tell on one's strength, and I felt that I was not the horse that I had once been. Grant said at once that he would take Hotspur, and there were men on the stand who would have bought me, but Jerry said I should not go to cab work again with just anybody, and the Governor promised to find a place for me where I should be comfortable. The day came for going away. Jerry had not been allowed to go out yet, and I never saw him after that New Year's Eve. Polly and the children came to bid me good-bye. "'Poor old Jack! Dear old Jack! I wish we could take you with us!' she said, and then laying her hand on my mane, she put her face close to my neck and kissed me. Dolly was crying and kissed me too. Harry stroked me a great deal, but said nothing, only he seemed very sad, and so I was led away to my new place. End of chapter 45 End of part 3